listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Gender gaps remain a significant influence around the world, and having women in leadership positions can make a difference to your business or organization's performance and the bottom line. But here's the thing. If a woman doesn't believe in the value of her contribution and her capabilities, she rarely delivers all she can. So both dollars and innovation are left untapped, and they may not have walked in the door in the first place. So our guest today says that when that happens, it's most likely due to the gender code. Hi, this is Sarah. Thanks so much for downloading this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, a podcast all about shedding limiting labels and beliefs so that we can lead fulfilling, meaningful, and purposeful lives. And I believe without a doubt, we are each capable of more than we imagine. And so does my guest today, Danielle Dobson. So before I bring Danielle on and we get to have a great conversation, let me tell you a little bit about her background. Danielle is an author. She's a speaker, a coach, and an advocate. She has a, she is a CPA and she has an extensive 14 year corporate background. And she's covered everything from private practice to multinationals. And she's lived and worked in four different countries. But seven years ago, Danielle pivoted away from her corporate career to help working mothers find more freedom and fulfillment through coaching in well being. And this change wasn't just out of the blue, but it came on the heels of identifying the high level of stress and overwhelm being experienced by working mothers, including herself. So, yep, she's a working mom and she knows all about the challenges of that. And she quickly learned that there were other factors holding professional women, especially those in high pressure roles, back from having the lives they want. She wanted to find out more about the details and what the factors were, if you will. So she interviewed more than 50 women and also some really good men in leadership positions across a diverse range of industries. Also, she could find what works in helping women use what they already have to get what they want. And that's what she wrote about. That's the subject of her book and now the the framework for how she helps people. Her book is called Breaking the Gender Code. Now, Danielle uses that body of work today as she helps women break free from gender codes that are holding them back. And she also helps organizations understand the impact of a gender code in their business or on their business. And I love this quote from Danielle. She says, we don't have to accept the status quo, and the negative impacts of the gender code, we can write and execute our own code by reprioritizing what is most important. So I hope you enjoy today's conversation with Danielle. Now let's welcome our guest, Danielle Dobson. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for that amazing introduction. It's so great to be here on on the other side of the world and, and, and speaking with you. Thank you. Well, and, and as we were talking before we got started, this is early morning for you and it's afternoon for me. So um, I hope you're raring to go and um, ready for our conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm fired up. <laughs> Good. So um, I do like to start by asking our guests a question about if they have a habit or practice or something that they do every day that keeps them really headed towards their personal big vision or goal? Mm, excellent question. I think in terms of a, a physical, the physical side of things, something that I picked up while living in Beijing in China was the importance of a morning ritual. So um, Every morning I get up, I get up quite early uh, and because I was actually sick and tired of the human alarm clocks waking me up. I actually wanted to take back a little bit of control of my day. And at the time, my boys were two, four and six. 
Um, and so I, I learned about the importance of it and I thought, okay, let, let's give that a go. So wake up early, um, have a hot water, hot water with lemon in it. Um, hopefully that flushes out the pipe and then some qigong in the morning. So it's about a half an hour routine and it really grounds me. So it really helps me start up the day on my terms and it's like giving to the world, you know, giving to the set yourself before you give to the world. And from there, I you know do all the you know preparation, setting everyone up else up for success, and then I do my exercise, like whatever that that is. And and because we live where we do near the beach and near the bush, um, I, I do bush walking or swimming or weight training or something, and it really sets me up well for the day. So I think that's and I, and I feel like if I've done that, then. There's no room for resentment for the in the rest of the day because I've I, I don't need I'm not chasing that me time or carving that time out for myself because I've started with it. So I think that that I've been doing since 2013. So it's it's a great start to the day. Wow. And you know what I really love about that is you're not chasing it anymore, right? You did that right off the top of your day. But I'm curious, when you first started doing that, was that hard to do? Did you like think, oh, I should really be taking care of the kids? Or did you just go, well, oh, this makes perfect sense to me. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> That's a really great question because um, through my research and all my conversations with, with mums that, that I know and through, you know, this whole parent, you know, adventure for 14 years, it is something that a lot of mums and women struggle with. So it's a really great question. I guess I've been fortunate because I've pretty much always prioritised some sort of exercise. So exercise has been really important to me. So, um, you know, I developed practices and support networks to be able to exercise. So this, you know, instigating this morning routine, routine didn't feel like a big departure. And also it was a slow process. So it was an exposure therapy. So I started, I just I got up earlier. So no one needed me before, you know, I got up at, you know, quarter past five. So no one actually needed me in, you know, in that kind of time. So I was cheating a little bit, I guess. Um, but it I, I guess because I was used to prioritizing exercise, because I knew that if my well-being wasn't um you know good if 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 I went down we all went down because I had you know 100 care for my children uh their dad at the time traveled and whatever so it's all I've been a closet single parent for a long time um before we were divorced so um it is a really great question because I was asked this question to when I was um struggling a little bit with my first child when he was a baby with his sleep and that sort of thing and speaking to advisors and you know uh, counselors and, and that sort of thing, um, and you know talking about the parent guilt and how that that was kicking in for a lot of mothers who didn't even want to exercise and leave their child. But for me, it was like I needed to do. I did it from the time my son, when we were living in America at the time, was you know a, a baby. As soon as I could get back in the gym because I just know how good it is for me. You know, it's like moving meditation. So it is a great question. And it's something that I haven't, I haven't felt really guilty about. I actually, you know what? I use it as a really great handbrake. Like, so it's like, I've got, I, I actually use, you know, my kids and getting back to them as a way to stop exercising. Cause you know, if I'm running or walking or in the bush or something, right. I've got to get back for the babysitter. I've got to get back. <laughs> so I push myself really hard in that time. And I use my kids as handbrakes along that line. So I've got to get my exercise done before they get up. You know, that kind of thing. So <laughs> I like it. I, I, I never heard it. that term to use your kids as a handbrake, but I do like that. <laughs> um, and also, like you're saying, once you started doing that and weaving it in, at least for me when I did it, a little bit at a time like that, it just mm. was one of those self um affirming things right you do a little mm. and it feels great so you you continue Absolutely. so it's not a burden to do it you actually look forward to doing it and then i was asked by a health coach 
it was just earlier this week, she goes, what are some of the non-negotiables you're taking into 2021? I thought, wow, interesting. I haven't been asked that question. I said, uh, my morning routine. And I realized I started my morning routine. It was about 15 minutes long, right? And I wake up between 4.45 and my body just wakes up anyway. So, mm. um, but I'm thinking, oh yeah, that 15 minutes. Oh, it's a full two hours now because it's added. I read, I do different things. Yes. I walk, all that stuff. Yes. But like you said, I'm no longer resentful when I, I love hitting my desk to work because I've gotten mm. everything I need for me out of the way. So absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the other thing is, I, I loved how you're saying that about, about your morning ritual, because if we look at a lot of, of you know, cultures throughout history and, and modern day, you know, Indigenous cultures, the vast majority of them, the ones that I've looked into, so I, it's not, you know, ex exhaustive, have morning rituals where they welcome the, the sun, where they welcome the day. Um, where they ease into the day. So I know Indigenous Australians have um, morning ceremonies. I uh, can't recall what it's called right now, but um, it, it's it's a really great grounding practice for the rest of your day. Um, and I guess that, and that's, you know, where it all came from for me was, you know, the Taoist principles of, um, you know, Eastern philosophy. So it, you know, if people were doing it for millennia and then all of a sudden we've stopped and then, you know, you look at the stats in terms of health for, you know, your nation, our nation, a lot of the Western world, you've got to sort of ask yourself the question, don't you? Like, what what could we be doing better, you know? Yeah, yeah. I I do ask those kinds of questions like, hmm, what do you think changed here? You know, and yeah. what could I be responsible for versus just saying, well, these things are outside my control. Not everything is. So, mm. um, so anyway, thank you for that. I, I always appreciate hearing and learning about how people frame their days and especially folks who feel fulfilled in their lives, you know, as busy or complex as they are, but people who are connected and enjoy their lives. So thanks for sharing that. But now I want to talk about the gender code. Um, and one of the quotes that you shared with me or a piece of information about you that you shared was that you played AFL, which is Aussie rules football when you were younger and you were the only girl on the entire club. So you started breaking the gender code from a young age. How did that occur? Like, were you encouraged to do that by your parents? Was that just your nature to say, hey, I wanna be on the team, let me on? Or how did that come about? What was your influence? Mm, great question. So I'm the eldest of three and I have two brothers. And so from the time I can remember, we were all, always outdoor. I come, from, I come from the Yarra Valley in Victoria, which is a semi-rural sort of place. And my favourite place was outside. So I was always moving, um, doing things with my hands, very kinesthetic. Um, I love being outside. And so when you've got a brother who's I don't know, 14 months younger than you and you start doing stuff together, we would play cricket you know, um, on the road. Uh, we'd kick the footy, kick to kick, you know, be outside, ride bikes, do jumps. Um, so it, it's a really nature nurture sort of thing. It's like, well, the environment that we're in um, provided those opportunities. But then also, I love to, to 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 move. Also, I guess the other one, the other thing is, we we grew up with one TV, and my dad's a big sports nut, and so in winter. It was Aussie rules on the TV. In summer, it was cricket. So that, I guess by osmosis, that, you know, the sport and strategy and just watching it, walking in and out or whatever, this, you know, you soak up the skills and, and the strategies um, by osmosis. So that, you know, I and that was kind of my life. Um, and then, you know, I, I was thinking it was when I was 11. I always wanted to play AFL and cricket and there were no girls teams. It, it was just totally unheard of. And I just thought, why can't I play? I mean, you know, I, and I checked the rules. My dad was actually the secretary of the junior football club. He was for, for years and years. And, um, and he checked it out and it was all okay. And he said, well, there's no reason why you can't play. And interesting because myself and my younger brother, 
um, close in age, I was in his team <laughs> and he, <laughs> but he was really, really great about it. Um, he had no problems at all, not none that he fed back to me. Uh, and he's exactly like that now as an adult, you know, very open and accepting. Um, so, so yeah, I just, I just thought there's, you know, why can't I play? And it also, it actually became a mission to, to get in that team. So, so that, that's what I did. It's just like, you know, why, why couldn't I, I know how to play. I play in the, you know, kick to kick with my brothers. I'm just as good as anyone else. Um, I'm going to give it a go. And yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Um, and that's so interesting when you said you grew up in a one TV household, as did we. And mm. I think about them now I'm going, they're like everywhere. And, yeah. yes, um, yes. and they're like, it depends on what room you're in and who's watching, right? It can be mm. like nuts. So I really like those days of one TV. Yeah. Uh, well, we've actually got one TV. Um, and it, it's in a family area and we've all got to agree on the movie. Um, sometimes my older one will go down and watch something on his phone, but, you know, it's got to be in a shared space and stuff like that because, yeah. I don't know, they grow up so quick. I just want to keep I know. people well, us all together. Well, I think about what you're saying about spending time outside. I just remember my mom would come up, turn the TV off, and she goes, it's Saturday, it's sunny, get out. Yeah. <laughs> Like we're not watching TV. And yeah. I, you know, at the time you're a kid, you're thinking, well, I was in the middle of something. I was like, go. Yeah. Or yeah. she would run the vacuum. You couldn't hear the TV anyway. Yeah. So you laugh. I love but, that tactic. Yeah. She, she never that. stressed her out. She didn't yeah. yell. It was like, not a problem. Here comes the <laughs> vacuum. Who can hear over it? And they're not quiet. So um, anyway, yes. And a, everybody, really seven good. kids agreeing on one thing. Not likely. No, Get out. No. We'll have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about breaking the gender code, um, specifically the research you did and what you learned. But can you explain what you mean when you say the gender code? Because I think it would provide some context for understanding the work you did and, and what you learned. Mm, brilliant. Great question. So the gender code is that set of default beliefs that we all recognize about the so-called natural differences between men and women. And these beliefs create stereotypes that specifically prevent women from uh, pursuing our dreams and, and achieving success. Because the, according to the gender code, women are typically pigeonholed into the role of carer and men are typically pigeonholed into the role of provider. And as much as we intellectually know that is not the case, it, the gender code is so strong that a lot of the way our society is organised and the structures that are in place are all according to this gender code. So women play the support role. And you just have to look at, at, at the roles that we um, are paid for, the roles we're not paid for, um, and, and you see it everywhere. It influences the way we think, feel, react. And the challenge is that the gender code is so strong that we buy into it and then it creates these pressures for ourselves like you know these expectations and pressures pressures to perform and um you know high expectations that are really challenging to meet so um i guess the the, the you know there's challenges and pressures around um you know perfectionism um the mental load um you know productivity pressures and then the, the biggest one of all that affects um you know women in particular is is the pressure to have it all that pressure around um you know that we've a lot of women have aspired to for um generations to so having a, a happy relationships a successful career um loving family but the the problem is that it's actually resulted in either or and deep divisions because we're thinking we have to um you know come up with some amazing balance equation or you know juggle and straddle two worlds um but we're, we're actually it's actually holding us back the things that we're trying to strive and 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 achieve are actually getting in the way of being who we really are 
So when you say that, I'm curious, is that, um, well, let me back up to when you were doing your research and interviewing um, your leaders, because you said you were interviewing professional women and some men in leadership roles. So, mm -hmm. and I think about the gender code, but I'm also wondering if there were any nuances based on the other factors around gender, such as um, age, ethnicity, race, um, where people grew up, their religious, I mean, did you, were those also overlaid on what you learned on the gender code or was it kind of similar across the board? So it's a, it's a really great question because when we talk about gender, we all, you know, the, the conversation does include diversity or, you know, all the time, you know, all the time. With the research that I was doing and the lens that I was looking through as I was interviewing people was specifically about, um, you know, what's working well and well, what are the challenges, but what really I wanted to know what's working well about being um, a leader and then a, and a lead parent. So I was really looking through that lens. So my focus wasn't as much on, um, uh, you know, the, the other deeper factors that we look at that we can box up. But if we have, a, so that I did interview some women of colour, not because they were women of colour, but because they were women who were recommended to me for their leadership um, uh, abilities. Um, so I wasn't really looking through those lenses. I will say that, you know, people who have come from really tough backgrounds, so where there's been a lot of financial hardship, so, so uh, one woman from uh, India um, who was really challenging um, upbringing, um, people, and, and so people have been in challenging family situations, um, people who are, you know, divorced and, and doing it by themselves, um, they all have a unique you know, lens and, and a unique code that they've built throughout their life. And, and I think what happened was I had assumptions, misconceptions, judgments, not necessarily around their ethnic, you know, uh, their cultures or, um, you know, sexual orientation or anything like that, but more about their choices around career and motherhood and also the roles that they played. So I had this assumption that all bankers were pretty cutthroat, awful people. And I interviewed about four of them and they were the most amazing leaders I've ever met. So what happened was I was able to start cutting through all of those assumptions and all of my unconscious bias and some was conscious and connect with them as human beings. And that was one of the most incredible outcomes of the whole entire process. And, and I, so we're not talking about radical you know, diversity here in terms of the boxes that we would look at, but the differences of people because of their, the code that they've built over their life, thinking that we're so different, but actually we're so connected, you know, So let me ask you about that code, um, because you said people who grew up in like, you know, really challenging situations, and you gave some examples of some of the different hardships, but then you said they kind of developed a code. Were, was the code, or were the codes they developed, were they similar to, to each other's code, that group that had more like challenges or difficult situations in, that formed them? Was their code similar to each other's in a, I would say yes in terms of their attitude and approach to success and achievement and wanting to swing the pendulum in the complete opposite direction to their experiences to the extent that the one woman I spoke to um, and she wasn't a parent, uh, but she was highly recommended by people that I'd interviewed in her team to speak to. So, so I did, and I'm so glad I did because she grew up in a very harsh, um, you know, family environment and financial hardship, 
um, in a rural place in um, England. And she decided that if she ever had a family, that she would make sure that they're, um, that they're secure, that they felt um, protected, they felt loved, and they, they wouldn't have you know, financial hardship. So a lot of her code was built around that. She had an incredible job and she decided that she couldn't be a parent and, and do what she did at work well, so she chose not to have children. So but then the interesting thing is when she was talking about her team, all 300 of them, she'd actually created that environment that she wanted to create for her family. It was exactly, and, I, and she said, yeah, it's, it's like I'm the matriarch. And I joke about that, you know, often. And that for me, it, it just, it, it, it completely opened up this whole way of looking at not only just the code that we've built, you know, throughout our life and how that influences us in everything we do, and in particular in leadership, but how those elements of caring for others, of setting others up for success, of helping them feel secure and that their contribution matters, what a powerful leadership asset that is. Asset that is. Because this person had people queuing up to be on her team. She had people asking to mentor her, mentor, her, mentor her often. She was right. She rose up through the ranks really, really quickly. She's got an incredible job now in uh, an Asian country. Um, and so I think, in terms of of that as well, and you asked me before about the similarities in terms of codes. I think they all had a deep desire to do better, to, to, to provide for others what they feel they missed out on and to, you know, set everyone else up for success around them. Did that, that, was, did that surprise you? Yes, it did. And that was based on my lens of, and my experience in the corporate world, in male-dominated engineering service majority engineering services companies uh, where the the focus was all about profit bottom line and bonuses that was all we were we were there for to do and I had not experienced any leaders like her the caliber of her I it was it was all pretty cutthroat it was all about money and numbers so and I thought because she was a high level banker that that she would fit that box. So that was my bias there that I needed to break. Isn't so that did fun though me. when that happens, when you're going, ooh, that was an assumption on my part. Isn't that fun when you get that kind of like that bubble yes. pops and you go, yeah. everything looks different. It's crystal clear in some area. And it's like fun. You're going, ooh, boy, that feels great. Um, totally, totally. I can't, I can't tell you walking out of that plush, like, I don't know, how many 50 story building in the city after having the interview with her and it's like I had to sit down because I was like oh wow wow this is it there's so many bubbles that have bursted right now and I had to really take it in and I was fortunate because everyone allowed me to uh tape the interview so I, I did listen to it many times and had it transcribed and it was the start of a really incredible, you know, bubble, but you know, just a, a lot of bubble bursting. <laughs> a lot of aha moments. Like you went, oh, oh so many. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Was there anything that was distressing for you to see or learn in your, in, through your interviews? Mm, great question. And there was, because I, what, what was distressing was, hearing the stories of discrimination in the workplace, inappropriate treatment of women, harassment, um, and then how under all of those conditions and, and trying to achieve at a high level, how the you know, unequal distribution of unpaid work you know, went in the home and in the workplace to women. You know, it was, it was heavily skewed towards women. And 
it just occurred to me because it was interesting in my corporate career I, I accepted a lot of the the status quo and the norms as that's just the way it is growing up in a very male world you know like that but I think what and what happens though is when you see others suffering and you see and you hear their suffering and you can and really feel it then it triggers something deep within you and it and it just compelled me to want to do something about it so that's when I started looking into why are we where we are and what impact is it having right now and how can we fix it so that's what got me really researching going down those rabbit holes and where I came to the gender code so let's talk a little bit about um, your book and first let me ask you when someone reads it, what do you mm. hope their takeaway is? Mm. Excellent question. So it depends on the type of person they are. So um, there's there's really two parts to it. You know, the first part is the the explore, exploration into what is the gender code and how we got here. So that's full of aha moments. And yeah, you know, the, that connection I see that in my workplace I see that in my home yeah that isn't fair what are we doing so so there's that that's kind of like an opening of the minds section of the book so if if you would like the opening part and that that's enough then that's great but then the whole second part of the book is okay this is how it is let's question the code understand what it's all about and interpret it and then ask the question, do we want to continue on this path? And if, you, and if you do, that's totally fine. But if you don't, you can choose to reorientate and, and think about which parts of the code that I've built do I want to keep and value because it's really important to me. Which parts do I want to delete? And then which new parts do I want to create? I guess, well, I guess that's another part of it. It's like have that reflection piece. And, and, and then the next part of the book is the action, like creating and writing your own code. So I guess I would like people to walk away thinking that they don't have to accept the status quo as it is right now. And you can write and execute your own code. And there's a framework or guidance that you can use to do that. And when you're working with folks one on one, are you you're working through that process with them? Yes. So it's an interesting. I have that framework. It's called Circle um, acronym, and we, you know, we we do work through that together. But depending on time and the person's individual challenges, we may not go through all of them. We'll go through what is most important and what they need based on their unique context. So it's not a um, specific uh, process or a step-by-step, -step. it's what's most needed for that individual person based on their unique challenges. When you've worked with someone, um, well, let me ask, how long typically are you working with an individual in this case? I know you also work with at the organization or business level, but I'm thinking specifically one-on-one -on -one with someone. How long typically is your engagement with them? Great question. And this also depends on, you know, where people are at. So I do conduct like 90 minute sessions. So that's really, but that's more of a um, awareness and an understanding. And and like a, at the moment, actually, I'm, I'm running uh, reset sessions so looking at closing out 2020 and drawing a line in the sand and then having a structured review about what we want to take forward into 2021 and then developing an action plan so that that all that's kind of a you know 90 minute but longer engagements yet it, it, I go through the process a lot more um, slowly with kind of homework and things in in, in between so the different prices. And what has been or have been some of the um, 
transformations the folks you work with have had that you're just thinking, oh my God, I'm so grateful that I did this work and now I can be part of this transformation? Mm. I think the biggest ones for me, it's not necessarily really easy to, you know, outwardly measure, but it's when they say, I don't feel guilty anymore. I don't feel like I have to be everything and do everything all the time. It's not all on me. Um, I can drop the mummy guilt. I can be successful in my career. I can also be an awesome mum. that I mean thinking about that now like that kind of feedback too it just it lights me up because that is the fuel that keeps me going with this and that is a type of fuel that kept me going with writing the book that is what this is all about yeah that kind of that freedom and release and I think when we feel that way man we can do so much great things and I don't mean like produce always but we just can Mm -hmm. be more mm-hmm. and um, then everybody we interact with benefits as well as ourselves absolutely, absolutely. When- but I'm going to get pragmatic with you mm-hmm. um, for a mm-hmm. second so say I'm a business owner and I've got women and I, I have a mix let's just say I have a mixed team small team why should I care about the gender code as a business what does it mean to me as a business so as a it's a really great question and I guess it depends in terms of how we measure it on the size of the business and and the contribution of the people and the women in your business. So let's just say you have, um, okay, so a smaller size business and you've got um, challenges with team cohesion or things around, you know, flexible working and you've got some people who are, who can do it, some people who can't do it, then you've got resentment within your whole organisation, not just not just the women because it's not something that is norm, normalised. Um, taking the, that sort of gendered approach out of that, so looking at normalising things like um, policies and practices, it's going to support everybody and all families rather than focusing just on on women and perpetuating the belief that it's the woman's role to look after the children. The more that we can support families in in small businesses, medium businesses, large businesses, um, to be able to to raise families, to care for others, it, it actually allows for a more holistic contribution from people in your business. So they can bring their whole self to work and so that's all the best bits and you know all the you know challenging bits too but they can bring their whole selves to work rather than being pigeonholed with with the gender code or adhering to it and all the pressures that are resulting from it well and i think about some of the single dads i know that um they needed the same kinds of Absolutely. And I don't want to call them accommodations, but the considerations mm-hmm. that they would have had had they been moms, mm, exactly. you know, without the stigma, right? They mm. may legally have been there and policy been there, um, but just a different, you know, kind of approach or people reacting to it. So it's it benefits kind of everybody. Absolutely. So and it it's important to understand, interpret, question the gender code as a foundation and then with the next step being creating gender balanced organizations and businesses so so not not about um saying okay so so we understand the gender code let's do a women in leadership project program it's that's all very needed but the the way to really make a, a lasting impact and and you know enhance capability around this is to start with behavior change. So awareness, um, you know, organization-wide campaigns, leader-led programs, um, recognizing that this is behavior change and culture change. This isn't fixing the women or blaming the men. That's something that Aviva Wittenberg's Cox talks about. Um, She's a bit of a rock star in this space. Uh, And she talks about gender balanced organizations. So creating gender balance. And so then hopefully that does 
relieve some of the stigma with um, you know taking parental leave, not not just you know um, you know. Uh, what is it? So in Australia, we call it main carer or primary carer and secondary carer. That that's nuts. Everyone looks after um, people, you know, equally. Um, and you know, looking at how organisations can support people to bring their whole selves, to work on their whole selves, to to be their whole selves, um, by allowing those accommodations that you mentioned for everyone. For everyone, right? Because I also think, and you use this word um, when you were talking about having things be clear, right? Mm. It, when you don't do that, it can breed resentment, which then breeds divisiveness, which is not what you're after, you know? Mm. And so it can be really counterproductive to think in silos, if you will. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And, and sometimes it, it can feel like, um, you know, if one part of the population is receiving additional resources and attention people can start looking through that lens for everything you know that that that's why I'm missing out because of that that's why she's getting that because of the gender thing whereas if it's all if it's about cultural change about um you know inclusive behaviors and mitigating unconscious bias and accepting that that unconscious bias is all part of being human. If you've got a brain, you're going to have it. it. It's okay, you know, and that's part of, you know, understanding your personal code and and keeping those parts that you want to keep, but you're just being aware of, of the code that you've built and then leveraging all the strengths that you have around who you are and your code and your identity um, rather than blaming or shaming any of those. So bringing everyone along um, you know, for ultimately in a business to achieve what you want to ch achieve, which will be unique for each business. Yep. Yep. And I think um, as I have grown, I've also recognized in the, when you say we all have the unconscious bias, it's like, you want to say, no, no, I don't. You're thinking, oh yes, mm. yes, you do. Mm. Because yeah. when we have a knee jerk reaction to anything and mm. I will, you know, raise my hand here and say, I can have an internal knee-jerk reaction to a suggestion. Um, mm. That's a very simple suggestion by someone else, but it's like my internal thing is like, no way, no way that's happening. And then all of a sudden mm. I'm going, really? <laughs> Why mm. do you say that? Um, because, mm. but part of it is this just habit or a belief that may be so outdated um, mm. and not linked to anything in reality anymore. So until that kind of it gets challenged or I get the chance to reflect on it, um, it's there, you know. And Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's been a, a lifetime of wiring, of neural pathway strengthening. And, you know, we had, uh, I think it was worldwide around the premise that if you do 10,000 hours of practice of something, that you become an expert. I think it has been challenged, but um, so if you think of how you're reinforcing your code over your lifetime and how many hours that would have been when you're a child, um, it's no wonder, you know, that you become an expert at caring for others. You could become an expert at filling in all the gaps. You become an expert at putting everyone else first. It's uh, Or you become an expert at focusing on um, career or, you know, being the provider, it's, it's all okay, because it's, yep. it, it's all part of, you know, your coding. It, so it's starting part of from our that human point, experience. Totally. Yeah. And we, like yeah. you said, you get to keep what you value, delete mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. doesn't, and then create what is best for you. Mm. Um, yes. And I think we're all a little bit different. So, and I will say that some of those wacky things are self-preservation things, you know? So some of the things that someone may think, well, I'm not sure that serves, if you put them in another context, you're thinking that's the exact person I want with me, right? Mm -hmm. So I think context mm -hmm. can also frame. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that goes back to your whole leadership thing too, right? What's the purpose of this group and those types of mm -hmm. things. So what, 
um, is the best way, Danielle, for people who want to either work with you directly or know more about you, grab your book. What's the best way for people to connect with you? So the best way to connect is either to email me at uh, danielle at codeconversations.com.au or go to my website uh, that has a, a lot of information about my book and some reviews and, and everything I've been doing in, in media. It has a media page um, and that's www.codeconversations.com.au. You can purchase my book off there, but it's also available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Nobu, all the all the usual suspects around online books, uh, the book online book sites, um, and and yeah, or I'm on LinkedIn daily, so uh, check me out there too. A little bit on Instagram, but um, mostly I do post on on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, if you find out more and uh, we can plan a you know, 10 minute Zoom, Zoom call, have a quick chat or whatever it is. And I, I love conversations. <laughs> so that's why, I, that's why I called my, my company Code Conversations because that's really um, what has opened up, you know, listening and speaking, but opened up everything, you know, just completely blew my world apart um, with this research project. But I honestly feel that every conversation counts. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage you, if you're interested, if you want to know more, email me, message me, or and we can set up a call. I'd recommend folks do that um, <laughs> because I've just enjoyed, first of all, I've enjoyed this conversation, but Danielle left me the best voicemail I really, and I know I told you that when I responded to it, but I thought by the time I'd listened to it, I'm thinking, oh, she's so interesting. I'm calling her back. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I want to encourage folks to reach out, um, to get the book, to connect with you. And Danielle, I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up. And that is, you know, we're, we're recording this at the beginning of December. So 2020 is almost in the rear view mirror. What are you looking forward to in 2021? Oh, so many things. I'm looking forward to bringing all of the, the incredible learnings from 2020 um, and embedding them into my you know, daily practices in 2021 and, and you know, not losing sight of, of it. Um, there's opportunities coming up, you know, we're really fortunate in Australia that we're in a really good place with um, with COVID. So we are going back to live events. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing the message with people in person and um, getting out there and helping people and, and spread this message. So I'm really excited about 2021. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll be sticking with you on LinkedIn so I can keep up to date with what you're doing. Right. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So that's it for this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening. I do have a request. If you enjoyed this conversation with Danielle, I definitely want you to go out and link to her page, let her know what you thought about it, but help us continue to share the message of hope and possibilities through your inspired action. If you would visit us at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast um, and click on the link there, you can help get this word out to more people. If you would go and leave a rating and review on wherever you're listening to this podcast, that would be great because the more people who listen, the more people that Danielle and my other guests can help open doors for them as they go forward in their lives. And until next week, I wish you all the best. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. 
You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.